Okay, um, we'll get started in just a minute. Let me. Last, last week I was having problems with Zoom and it's kind of acting up a little bit here. All right, well, let's go ahead and open up in prayer and I'll give you a sense of what we're going to be covering today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, pray that you would bless each of the students in this course, Lord. I pray the material that we cover will be clear, that they can see how this is going to be applicable for their future and get them a, a chance to understand the, the nuances of computer architecture. Pray that you would help them with their spiritual formation, Lord, that they can really enjoy the time that they can be studying scripture, the, the, the places where they can get some insight into the theological concepts in which we want to be guided in our lives by, and give them interesting and creative ways for faith integration. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, um, what we're going to be covering today is now going into this next section, which is gonna be not as large as this first one, where we talked about computer systems in fair amount of detail, mostly focusing on IO um, and memory. And then we got it into this last um, chapter, we were talking about operating system support. And I've been trying to tie that in with what we do on Thursday, which is a little bit different. And so now we're going to be getting into um, the first lecture is going to be talking about number systems, how you represent things in binary, the way that a computer will be looking at things. And at this first chapter, um, chapter 10 is relatively short. And so I know in the beginning, some of these chapters were a little bit long, but I think now you'll see that they're, they tend to be more manageable. Um, and so we'll talk about numbers, number systems, and probably I'll do a little bit into computer um, arithmetic as well. Um, in, in regard to, to number systems, I'll open up the Mars app just to give you a little bit of a sense of um, where this can start to be ap applicable um, and where you actually would see it. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the blue screen of death Usually it gives like a core dump. That's a, an expression of basically it's downloads things from the core, from the memory. Um, and so remember memory is the access of what you're doing for, for read and write for what you're doing using the computer for, but it's also the stuff about the program. And so basically it gives the, the, the last state before it died. And so you'll see, you'll see like these, um, hexadecimal numbers that are listed here. And so this will give a little bit of insight into what that's all about. So I've been using my, my greatest hit charts. And so for this chapter, this is going to um, be the kind of things that we're going to talk about where how do you do this positional interpretation of information going from say decimal to binary or hexadecimal or octal Octal is something that's a little bit more historic, but we'll definitely be talking about binary and hexadecimal. And so basically how we, we normally think of um, numbers in base 10, it's, it's, it's easy. We're just kind of, we're programmed to, to think about it this way. And so if you have like 10 to the zero, that means it's the first digit. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then if you have 10, if you just go over one digit, you automatically, because it's base 10, you know that it's at whatever that number is times 10. And if you go over one more, whatever that is, number is times 100 or 10 to the two. Well, we have that same kind of uh, thing that goes on for, for binary numbers, except for base 10, it's actually base two. And I just realized that these should be um, two to the third Maybe I'll just, it doesn't screw things up. Maybe I'll try and do this real time. Hopefully it doesn't kick off the sharing of my screen. I think it might've done that. So um, I'll double check that in a second. So this should be two, two. This should be two.
Okay, so share my screen again. So um, maybe that little thing there might be familiar because I know it, it, it is a, a little bit quirky, but once you get the hang, hang of it, it's going to be fairly easy for you in your head to do these conversions. And so this is a um, table from chapter 10 that shows conversion going from decimal to binary and hexadecimal. So these are probably the, the three main ways that you'll do it. And you notice how oftentimes when you have a binary, they'll group it in, in bits of four. <laughs> this is just a shortcut for how you would convert that to hexadecimal. Um, you can see like this first one, um, when it's one here, so this is, um, this is the second digit, and so we, we, we put it there. So you can see how that, that's where it starts to boil into that second thing for a hexadecimal. So if I was to, if I was to show you a 0, 1, 0, 0, over a period of time, you can say that's, you know, this is the first digit, so that's one or two. The next one is um, the, the thing. So this is either one or zero. This one represents um, two to the one, so that's two. So it's either none or two. And this one, if it's one, it's either four or, or nothing. So two to the two is four. And so that's how we get four for, for that case. So that's just a little bit of a heads up of what we're going to be focusing on now in more detail when we get into um, the numbering system in chapter 10. So the decimal system, the, um, we'll get familiar with this positional numbering system. Then we'll begin to think about the binary system, how we do that, that um, go from one to another. We'll look at the, the details of converting binary to, to decimal, uh, both for integers and fractions. And they have a, a, um, a simple way that might be helpful for you to, to, to see how that works. And also, um, you'll sort of get a, an idea of how to be doing this in your head as well. And I was trying to allude that to that when I was talking about that table that I just showed, and we'll see it again in, in a few minutes. So here's the one that we're all familiar with. We can we can easily deal with the, the decimal system because since the day we were born, just about, it seems we're getting familiar with how we do this and then starting to, to know how to count, how to do add, um, subtract, and more difficult, but things that we'll talk about in the next chapter, not only add and subtract, but multiply and divide, how we do that equivalently in, um, in these kind of things that we're trying to, to address. So we see here 83, so it's eight times 10 to the one, so that's 80 plus three, and so that's how we, we get that. More complex numbers, it's the same thing, 10 to the three times four is this one here. Ten, seven times 10 to the two, that's the, the second most significant digit. Um, two times 10 to the one, that's two, and then we get eight. And so we can see how that works here to break that into um, those, those pieces. Um, we can also extend that, so we can also include fractions. Um, if, Maybe for you, especially in a calcular, calculator type of world or computer type of world, thinking things in decimal rather than fractions is probably uh, more convenient. And so basically what you need to be figuring out is, well, where is the decimal point? And from that, um, you, you go to, in the opposite direction. Instead of 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, it's 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. And so... Once again, it's fairly easy to see how that works in, in, in decimal, but we can be doing this in a similar fashion for binary um, as well. So this is just giving you a, a sense of how we can just cross 
Um, we can include um, integers as well as decimal numbers and aggregate all of that together um, fairly sim simply just by knowing where that position zero is. And we're, that's going to de define where we're going to put the, the decimal point and, and go from there. So if that's straightforward, which I think it should be, um, then we just get into, well, how do we start thinking about this in a more general sense and then begin to think of um, binary and hexadecimal? So in a general sense, instead of just having um, uh, what we would have from a decimal, we can just use the, the letter A to represent any point and the radix point being where we have the decimal point. And once we have that, we can start to figure out how we're going to be doing this for different bases. Um, personally, I'm, I would have done this with base eight, it's called octal, but here we're using base seven. And so maybe you might remember your multiplication table seven and seven times seven is uh, 49. And that's about all I remember in terms of doing it off the top of my head, but um, seven to, to the third power, 343, seven to the fourth, 2401. And we can do that in the opposite direction um, as they're, they're showing here. So if we wanted to be doing things in base seven, that's something that we could be doing. Um, and then we get into the, the base, the, the, the binary system, which is gets into now, and instead of using this general letter A, we're going to be using um, everything base two but it's gonna have the same way of looking at those numbers. Um, so once you know what your radix point where your, your decimal point is, we even call it a decimal point. So maybe you have to be a little bit careful and that's why using the term radix, might, radix point might be, be better. Then we can do this, this translation um, from one to the other. Um, and this just gives you a way of how that would work. Um, it, probably about six slides or, sh or so, I'll have an example for, for that. So this is just the, the general approach that goes about that. So we want to be do this conversion um, between binary and, 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 and decimal. And so a binary, um, first of all, the binary notation to decimal, we can multiply each binary bit by the appropriate power of two and then add the results. Decimal um, notation to binary notation, the integer and fractional parts are handled separately. And we'll see that in a, a minute. So we have a couple charts here that I'm going to, to skip. But this is just trying to give you a sense of um, the algorithm if you wanted to go into more details of doing that conversion. But I tried to verbalize that in what I was just trying to convey. And so I'll just um, use the, the picture as a way of starting to, to think about here. So this is an example for converting from decimal notation to binary notation. And so we have a, a base 10 number of 11, we wanna convert that to binary. So what you do is you first, you divide it by two. What is the um, remainder? So if, if there is a remainder, there's a one. Okay, that means that you put a one in that digit. So um, then you take the, what what's, So um, two times five is 10. So we, we know that. So we, there's, um, we put that down here, five divided by two, it's two plus remainder. So it, it, there was a, a value here. Um, and so since there is a remainder, um, we put a, a, a one there. Next, we go to the, 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 the next digit and there isn't a remainder, so this is zero, but evenly multiplied. And so we have one here and the and we get a one. So that's how we do that conversion um, for, for, for that example. For another example here, for 21 divided by two, so, um, we, we know that there is a remainder, so we put a one there. 
we take what the, the value multiplied 10 divided by two, we as a five uh, evenly um, divides by five. And so there isn't any digit that, that goes there, but we move the five down five divided by two um, is two plus we have a remainder of one. So we stick a number there, um, put the one down there. Um, it, and we do the, the same process of what we were showing above. So this is a, a more formal algorithm for how we would do this conversion. Um, I think folks in this class, you've already taken um, algorithms and data structures. And so this would be a thing that you could mechanize into some code and easily do that, that type of a conversion, which is you could either do it in hardware or software. Maybe as you've started to see some of the things you can be doing with gates, um, that might have been something that in the past it might not have um, been apparent to you. So similar to what we had in these previous two charts, we have the, the general algorithm approach. We have that. Now we have the, the same way of looking at it just to go through the, the theoretical um, construct for giving the algorithm details. Um, we have that over two slides. And then what we do is um, in reverse, kind of, but now we can look at how we convert decimal notation to binary. So instead of dividing by two, we multiply by two. So we have a, a decimal fraction of 0.81, and we're going to convert this to a binary fraction. So 0.82 times two is 1.62. So the integer part is one, we stick one there. We take the remainder, 0.62 times two is 1.24. There's a, there is an integer, you stick it up there, and then you take the, 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 the decimal portion, 0.24 times two is 0.48. And so there isn't any um, integer, so this is a zero. The same thing for this next one, there's no integer, so it's a zero. Finally, we get to this 0.96, we multiply that times two, 1.92, we get a one. And finally, we get to the, the last digit that we're going to compute, 0.92 times two is 1.84. And so we get this value and note that it says it's uh, approximate. It's like, what if we convert a fraction into integers, it's what's that? I'm sure you guys remember that. What would be the conversion in decimal of one third? Yeah, 0.33333. So that's what we have here, maybe in a concept that we're more familiar with. It's an approximation. So you go to as many digits as what you are, are using for your representation of numbers. So that's one case where it doesn't evenly divide, um, calculate, maybe I should say that instead. And here's a case where it does. So 0.25 times two, you get um, 0.05, there's no integer, so that's zero. You go to the next um, least significant digit, um, 0.5 times two is one and it evenly divides. So if we were to convert um, 0.25 decimal to, binary, it'd be 0 0.01. So remember that the first one is 10 to the minus one, I'm sorry, two to the minus one, and then and the next one is two to the minus two. So it's like saying this would represent the one fourth digit. Um, and so that's so what it's, you can maybe think about that. It's just another way of saying one over four but now we're, we're putting it into that, that, that way of how it corresponds with a, a binary digit that um, relates to that. For hexadecimal notation, this is commonly used, and you can see this that I mentioned before, these grouping of four bits. And so over a period of time, you'll start to get this, um, you'll, rem you'll remember some of these number con conventions, like one zero 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 is eight, that would be fairly simple. I was alluding to this before, one zero zero is four, one zero is two. And having that this six, 16 complements is, is very easy to group together and quasi getting it into this um, decimal notation. It's the same, 
all the way up here until you get to this A, instead of saying 10, it's A. And so these last ones are things that won't be quite as familiar. And so that leads us to the table that I already showed you. Um, and definitely for the smaller ones, um, getting familiar with these first 16 ones are, are helpful. But even if you don't, it's easy to either generate one of these tables in Excel, if you like, or look it up in a, in a textbook or check it, check for it online, you're going to find that. So thus, there are ways that we do these conversions. Computers think in binary. That's the way that we've architected them. That was a design choice a long time ago. And so those are the things that we have. So in terms of hexadecimal notation, it's um, not only is it used for representing integers, but also um, as a concise notation for representing any sequence of binary digits. So you can have fraction, I mean, decimals, if you will, or um, as well as quote, um, representation of integers. Um, so there's a, a variety of reasons for hexade um, using hexadecimal notation. I've already talked about that. It is more concise. Imagine if you had to have everything in binary and you can see this is gonna take a lot of digits. And so um, even when you put it this way, that's still, this is a lot easier to read rather than having to scan all these digits and remembering this conversion. And so that's gonna be definitely helpful. In most computers, binary data occupy some multiples of four bits. Thus, we get back to why we see the space between them. It makes it a little bit um, more human readable or some multiple of those single hexadecimal digits. And so it's extremely easy to convert between binary and hexadecimal. And so I already mentioned that, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of that. So any questions on that? At least conceptually, that should be straightforward. Um, now we'll get a chance to be thinking about it. All right, we'll see if this continues to share my screen. It seems like I got some connections here between when I do PowerPoint and, okay, is it still sharing my screen? Be on the safe side. So, I'm not gonna to spend too much time um, going through Mars, but for the context of the lecture that we just went through, I'm going to go back and have us be thinking about this, but now be thinking about this um, binary versus hexadecimal representation of numbers, because this is going to the next step of what that actually means. Um, so, here we have is that this is one of the things that is act in the Mars app, and I know it's getting a, a little bit old, um, and I'm still looking at doing some conversions. It's going to take me a little bit of time to work through seeing what VS Code can do. I did find that there's both the x86 ways of doing assembly language. There are some apps you can do the um, the ARM implementation. Um, so I'd still need a little bit more time to get that up and running. But this kind of gives you some more diagnostic information that's kind of helpful to give you some, some insight. So we talked about the, the basic steps and in terms of your assembly language programs, doing something as simple as this, but maybe changing it to not be hello world, but to start to engage related to your, your, your project is what I would like. Um, one uh, comment I did get from the, the student surveys, and I appreciate everything that you shared, and I'm trying to, to take it to heart, but one of the things that seemed kind of odd to at least one or more of you was why are you doing this proposal at the very beginning when you don't haven't really done any of the coursework? And I guess that is true, but what I was trying to have you guys think about, this is in the future, you're going to be called in as a subject matter expert so let's say after you finish this course, you're now a subject matter expert, and now you want to get paid by NASA or paid by um, Amazon or Apple or whoever, 
that you're an expert now and they're going to pay you to do some coding. And so day one, they expect you to be an expert. And so the first thing they're going to want is a proposal that's showing your competency that you know what you're talking about and that you're actually going to do something novel that hasn't been done before. And so that's why they agree to pay you because you they already assume that you're an expert. Typically what they have in a, a proposal, they'll have like key um, principal and investigators that will have to include their resume and why they do have the credibility to do what, what they're going to be paid to do. So I know it seemed a little bit backward, but I'm also trying to forward think this of what you're gonna have in the, in the future. So just a little bit of a side there as I see things that are noteworthy from the, um, the what you guys provided in the survey, I wanted to, to mention that. So this is a fairly simple program. And here are some examples of what we can be doing to, to show um, these different no notations. So first of all, down here, you can have this hexadecimal addresses. So right now, these are all listed Uh, like that, but if I change it like this, this is now puts it into hexadecimal. So maybe kind of hard to read, but you can see that now there's places where the A, B, and C shows up. And so it's now a different base rather than having it in a decimal notation. So those are, that's one example where we can see that. Um, more in line of for a computer. And you can see how they put like this little notation, like um, a zero in front of it. It's just a, one of the possible notations for trying to make sure that you're not confused. Are you doing it in a decimal? Um, are you doing it in hexadecimal? We don't have a binary representation you, as has already been discussed that would be taking a lot of space. And so this is where we're, we're seeing this, this conversion of, of numbers. So if you can actually have like this blue screen of death um, printout, this is gonna be the kind of thing that you're going to, to see. And unless you have a context for what that is meant to represent, that's gonna be pretty difficult to, to figure out. But just to, to give you an idea, and I mentioned this before, and I can actually go through this, um, the, the term I'm used to using is ASCII, so the ASCII code of, of the binary representation of a uh, lowercase a, binary representation for an uppercase a. And so I might be able to work through it. So here, everything in this ARMS um, CPU emulator that we have is 32 bits. So if we have four letters here, that means that each one of them has eight bits. And so here, if I was to change this to, um, it'd be a little bit hard to do, but I think I can. So if I was to, to look that up two, four, six, eight, if I was to look up that 48, and I, I don't have a table open right now to go between that 48 and a capital H. That would be what's known as the, the agreed upon convention for, for that. So that's just an, an example of what we're seeing with the, the, the different way of how things are, are laid out. So just going back here, so this is, um, we're trying to remember for this program, we basically have two syscalls. First is we pass a, um, a message that we define at the bottom here to the uh, console, and then we do a clean um, terminate. Those are the two commands. That's all we do for this simple, simple one. We Maybe you could argue we don't have to do this last syscall, but that gives it just a cleaner way of, of, of doing that. So any questions on that? That's just trying to give you that next step, giving you some insight of using that, that binary and hexadecimal representation and how it's useful. I'll just check on online. Any comments or questions from, from those um, joining us remotely today? Andre, 
or Oates, any comments or questions? Okay, Andre, fine. Oates, any thumbs up or any comments or questions? Okay, good. Thank you for joining us. So um, that's all it is for, for that chapter, but it's, it's critical. It's one of those things, like if you wanna speak English, the first thing you need to understand is the alphabet and then start to think about the syntax, the grammar. And so there's, there's like an analogy for each one of those things that we have to be thinking through as we move along. So this is the first part in this triplet that we have here for this um, arithmetic and logic. The second thing is this computer um, arithmetic um, methodology. And I will straddle this, um, do a little bit today and um, either do it on part of our time on Thursday or a little bit next Tuesday, but I'll just um, begin to be thinking about how this goes. The expression I like to use with um, the AL ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, it's like the Swiss army knife. That's like the key in the processor of the program programmability that you have, which is pretty amazing. And so we have to think of what is the convention that we're going to be using for, for number representation. So numbers for integers, what about floating point representation, scientific notation? There's probably a term that maybe some of you heard of if you're not familiar with, with, with these things. There's an IEEE standard that, that defines that, trying to have some commonly used things. So that's the first thing that we have to do. And so how do you represent um, a positive number? How do you represent a negative number? And so there's various representations of how that's done. You just have a sign bit, that's one thing. There's something called the, the twos complement, that's, that's possible and other things. And then, um, then we want to be thinking about doing both integer arithmetic, um, what would be the agreed upon standard for having a negation of a number, and then look at addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. And in a similar fashion, how we do it when you have both a base and a mantissa, there's various ways of thinking about that. What is the number times something to the power of? Um, and if you, you have to go back and forth between those, and so some of that can get a little bit complicated. And so you may want to go ahead and, and spend the time to go over um, this chapter 11, if you haven't already, as we're going through this material, I think it'll help to, to demystify it. So, so the arithmetic logic unit is a part of the computer that actually performs the arithmetic and logical operations. So most of what we did with digital gates up to this point was looking at the logical operations. Um, in the next chapter, we'll actually show you um, what you can actually do a representation um, you can do adders um, and, and stuff like that, a half adder or a full adder, we'll get into that. All of this it's, can be done with digital logic. All of the other elements of the computer system are, are there mainly to bring data into the ALU for it to process and to take the result back out. So it's like the heart of the heart. You know, if you think of the CPU as the heart, and so this is like the main part of it, what it does. This what this is where the program program programmability comes in. And David and I were talking about this a little bit beforehand. That he watched the movie, The Imitation Game. Some of you may already seen it. I think David, you said that that was the first time you saw it. And so, just getting a chance to to see how would somebody create a fundamental architecture for computing. And Alan Turing was one of the first people that that did that. And so. Um, we've talked about the, the main elements of computing, the fetch execute. And so he was creating that environment where you have this, this computing environment that you, you do this one operation and the output of that is going to impact what you're going to be doing, doing next. And so, and so instead of having a dedicated capability as a reprogrammable um, capability that up to that point was really not available. 
So the ALU, last point, it's based on the use of simple di digital logic devices that can store binary digits and perform simple Boolean logic operations. So you can think of it this way. Um, you send the control things in. So are you gonna do an add, a subtract? Are you gonna do an OR operation? Or are you gonna do a load from memory, um, write to memory, those types of things? What are the registers that it needs to pay attention to? Is this the stuff that's gonna do the things on? Flags. So if you do an addition and um, you have a, a, what's one plus one? Well, in binary, so one plus one is one zero. So you have a carryover. So that could be an example of a flag that needs to be passed on that, okay, I did my job, but I have an overflow that would be an overflow. And so I need to have another um, computing module to take that on. And so you have input registers that flow into the ALU and the results flowing out into other registers. So this is where we're trying to get a little bit more insight into that when we're doing our assembly language program programming, just to give you a, a survey view of what that's all about. So we talked about integer representation in the last chapter. Now we're going to be using it for computing. So in the binary numbering system, arbitrary numbers can be represented with it. The digit zero and one, the minus sign for, for negative numbers and the, the period or radix point for the, the, the fractional component. For com the purposes of computer storage and processing, we, we do not have the benefit of uh, special symbols. It's all ones and zeros. That's all we got to, to, to go with. And so we have to do that, um, those conventions on our own to help us figure out what that is. So there's a couple of ways of how you can be doing sign um, representation. Um, you can have all of the alternative in, involved treating the most significant leftmost bit as a, as a sign bit. So I see either a one would be positive and zero would be negative or vice versa. If the sign bit is, is zero, then the number is positive. If the sign bit is one, the number is negative. That's possible. Um, it, it's a, the simplest representation to of how you can be doing the the, the sign bit. The, the drawback is a addition and, and subtraction require a, cons a consideration of both the sign uh, uh, of the numbers and, and the re relative magnitude to, to carry out the, the required operation. And so then you can have there, there could be two representations of zero. You can have positive zero and negative zero, which seems a little bit quirky. And because of these drawbacks, um, the sign magnitude representation is rarely used in the implementation, implementing the integer portion of an ALU. So we have a couple other ways that we can be, be doing that. Um, one of them we can get in here is a characteristic of the twos complement representation in arithmetic. So um, the number of representation of zero, instead of having two, we only have one. So that's actually good. Um, negation, we take the Boolean complement of each bit. Um, so there's something called the ones complement and the twos complement. So we take the, the Boolean complement of each bit to be the corresponding positive number, then add one to the result of the pattern viewed as an unsigned integer. So adding a one, that's a twos complement. Um, and then we can do the expansion of the bit, bit length. Um, you can add an additional bit positions to the left and fill it with the value of the original sign bit. And so this is how, when you do this um, um, conversion, the, this is can be one of those conventions that can be used. What about overflow? So if the, if the two numbers with the same sign, both are positive or both are negative, are added, then overflow occurs if and only if the result has the opposite sign. So the subtraction rule to subtract B from A, you take the twos complement of B and then add it to A. So maybe you've, you, you've done that in some way or another when maybe you're using a calculator and if you, um, you, you could do A plus B or A plus or A minus minus B and it's, it's that kind of concept is what we're trying to, to capture there. 
So this just gives you some of the alternative representations for four bit integers. Um, so decimal sign magnitude representation. So remember you, you might, you'll start to get a better sense of what these are, one, 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 that's four plus two plus one is seven. So you can see it's, once you remember what some of those bits are, you can do a conversion. Um, then we have the, the twos complement representation. And finally, we have um, a bias representation. So which, you know, what kind of dynamic range do we want to have? Do we want to be able to um, code for plus eight or minus eight? That would be possible. And so you can see that you can either have one or, but not both of those extremes is what's being laid out there. So I, I think that might be a good breaking point for going through this, but let me pause and see if there's any questions about this. So we've talked about um, various ways of representing numbers. Now we've done some of this precursor for how we would be doing some, some basic operations here, um, adding numbers, dividing, stuff like that. Any, anything that comes to mind? Am I losing people? Well, I can keep going for a few more minutes, but I, I see people nodding off a little bit. I just want to see if I need to break it up a little bit. So, Avery, any comments or questions? Kyle, okay, go keep going. All right. So um, I saw a few nods. So. Um, So this is just gives us some, some more details about the conversion between the two complement and, and decimal. And so um, so this is trying to show have a useful illustration of the nature of the two's complement or representation as a value box in which the value on the, the far right in the box is, is one, that is two to the zero, and each succeeding position to the left is a double in value until the leftmost position, which is a, a, a negated, is, is negated. As we can see in this figure I'm showing, the, the most negative two's complement number that can be represented is, is minus two to the n minus one. If any of the bits other than the sign bit is one, it adds a positive amount to the number. Also, it is clear that a negative number must have a one at the leftmost position and a positive number must have a zero at that position. Thus, the, the largest positive number is a zero followed by all ones, which is equal to two to the n minus one minus one. The rest of the figure illustrates the, the use of the value box to convert from two's complement to a decimal and from decimal to the two's complement. So um, that just gives us a, a little sense of what that is. And so um, if we wanted to convert it to decimal, so we have a decimal number, I mean, a, a um, binary number of minus 120. So here we have two ones, and so it's minus 128 plus eight gives us 120. That's how we can be um, thinking about that. And so to convert from binary to decimal, um, here we have an example. So we have one there and then two ones here. So it's minus 128 plus two plus one gives us minus 125. So that's um, one way to, to be thinking about that. And then the stuff that we'll get into is um, a little bit more details. It's sometimes desirable to take an n-bit integer and store it in, in m bits where m is greater than n. So this expansion of bit length is referred to as range extension. So we, we pad the number. So we if you have a 32-bit register, um, then you're gonna pad it with if you have like one zero zero, then you're gonna pad all of the, the digits above that with um, something based on the either a one or a zero. Um, so because the range 
uh, range of numbers that can be expressed as extended by increasing the, the bit length. In sign magnitude notation, this is easily accomplished. Simply move the sign bit to the new leftmost position and fill it with zeros. This procedure will work for two's complement and negate negative integers. Instead, the, the rule for two's complement integers is to move the sign bit to the, the new leftmost position and fill it with copies of the sign bit. For positive numbers, fill it in with zeros, and for negative uh, numbers, fill it with, with ones. This is called sign extension. So I know chances are you won't remember all of this, but I just, this, like I said, we're trying to do somewhat of a survey of the, the things that go on that maybe you've never thought of when you look under the hood for computing. Um, when we have this, this radix point, so finally we mentioned that a representative rep Presentations discussed in this section are sometimes referred to as fixed point. That is because the radix point, that is a binary point, is fixed and assumes it to be the, the right of the, the, the rightmost digit. The programmer can use the, the same representation for binary fractions by, by scaling the numbers so that the binary point is implicitly positioned at some other location. So maybe I'll go back to the previous chapter for a second and um, see where I got this example. So we have like this radix point somewhere. So you can always keep it fixed. And they talked about either having it all the way at one extreme or the other. That's what they were trying to have us um, think about with what I was just trying to describe. Um, this then gets into, well, how do we do um, negation and, and, and use that? So you can, the two's complement operation, we can take the Boolean complement of each bit of the integer, including the side bit, treat the result as an unsigned binary integer and add one. So we have that. So here we have the number. So we have two there. 2, 4, 8, 16. So 16 plus 2 is 18. And if we do a byte with um, byte wise complement, so whatever there's a 1, we turn it to 0. Whenever there's a 0, we turn it into 1. Then we add 1. And so this would be um, the what is intended to, to be how we, the two steps of how we get minus 8, 18. The negative of the negative of that number is it itself 18. So we do the same thing. We take the byte wise complement, then add one, and we get 18. So that may seem like a little bit non intuitive, but um, that, that just goes to show you of the power of once you figure out an algorithm and you use it, um, and then you can do an example and actually give the results that you would expect. So that's a process of how you would be doing negation in a computer. Um, so here we had this example of a, a minus zero and a plus zero. Um, that's something that we, we need to be mindful of that that can come up periodically. Um, the sec, so, this is the first special case. Uh, there is a carry out of the most significant bit position, which is ignored. The result is that the, the negation of zero is zero as it should be. And the second special case is more of a problem. If we take the, the negation of the bit pattern of a one followed by n to the minus one zeros, we get back the same number. And so we, we saw the, the negation of a negation that gives you the same number. That's what we would like to make sure that we get. Okay, I think I'll probably break it here because this is where we start to get into doing the um, actual calculations. And we'll see a couple ways of, of looking at this. And so I'd recommend that you go ahead and, and review chapter 11 if you haven't already. And we'll get into that a little bit um, Thursday and, and next Tuesday. So with that, we'll continue on our Thursdays being more of our lab day. Um, I'd like to have um, 
one or more students each week, share some of what they're doing with your projects. I know we've done with our first one. Now, um, if someone, even if you're not done, well, we can actually do some real-time development of your um, your Mars MIP, MIPS projects. Let's look at that. So make sure that you're with your computer, have it open. And this is a chance you could start to, if you haven't done any of the coding, um, start it. So you guys now have the, the Hello World program, maybe start trying to change some of those and maybe instead of saying hello world and um, say hello APU or whatever, just start to do some manipulation. Maybe see if you could add something else, maybe try and get some input from the console if you like, or adding a couple numbers. Um, this was an example that I was showing um, last time. So be on the safe side, I wanna make sure it's still sharing my screen. So this was, this is the hello world. Here's an example of having a program where you're adding two registers and putting the results in another register. And once again, you're gonna get a chance to be seeing the results here with what you're doing with, um, um, with this emulator. So it this is for its time, this was actually pretty useful. Um, it is getting a little bit dated. I did try um, running against a, a more current version of Java. Um, there's something called Open JDK and it still worked. So that was encouraging. Um, but th this is something that will be phased out as, as I teach this more. Um, in future classes. You can try doing various types. You can do a, try doing an add, a subtract, and um, or you could try the or or logical and. Those are also some com commands that I showed you. And begin just to think about what do you think you want to do with this project? Do you want to try and just do exactly what you did with your digital logic? You can, or maybe there's something else that you want to be exploring but you're hopefully getting a, a better sense of the distinction between these different parts of an architecture we're trying to have you see as we as we progress. Any questions on that? Okay, well, we'll um, call it a day there and I'll look forward to, to seeing you all on Thursday. I'll be up here if anybody has some comments or questions um, and feel free to come on by, okay? Thank you.